So I am pleased to introduce Yolanda Schmidt. She's from Towner, North Dakota, and she moved back to take her current position in Pierce County in August of 2012. She's a, in a single agent county, so that means she offers a whole bunch of different programs, ranging from ag and natural resources to horticulture to ag business, community development, and 4-H and youth development programs. So she's a busy lady. She's currently working on her master's degree in extension education with an emphasis on horticulture, and she likes to garden in her spare time. She also provided a fun fact, so we might all have a question about how she did this. She has successfully grown miniature bananas and oranges indoors. So with that, welcome Yolanda. Thank you, Julie. Um, so as Julie said, uh, today I'll be talking about herbs. Um, herbs um, have been around for centuries um, since the beginning of civilization and we've used them for everything from cooking to medicine, aromatherapy, um, religious ceremonies, even pest control and decoration. Um, but for today's talk we'll just be focusing on the culinary use of herbs and um, I'd like to note that growing your, your own herbs can be fascinating and satisfying at the same time. So to start with, we'll um, define what an herb is. Um, herbs and spices actually differ. Sometimes we use the terms interchangeably. Um, they both come from plants, but herbs are the fresh part of the plant, while the spice is actually um, a dried part. Could be a root, stalk, seed, maybe even a fruit of the plant. Um, whereas the herb is always used fresh and is usually going to be um, leaves or flowers. And then another unique thing about herbs is that they contain essential oils, which is um, a collection of chemicals that are responsible for their unique flavors and aromas. And the concentrations of these essential oils vary by the plant part. And that will depend on what particular herb is being grown. So some might be more highly concentrated in um, the leaf tissue. Some, um, the essential oils might be more heavily concentrated in the, the flowers. Um, it just depends on, on the herb and then what part you're using. Um, but the other unique thing about herbs is, as everyone knows, they can add flavor to whatever it is that we're cooking. Um, but the bonus is that we can add this flavor without adding additional fat or sodium to whatever it is that we're preparing. Um, most herbs are quite easy to grow. Um, they have very few pest problems for the most part. Um, actually, some herbs are um, rumored or known to um, repel certain pests. Uh, also, Herbs are rarely bothered by deer or rabbits, partly due to the scents that they give off from those essential oils that are present. But as most of us know with um, deer and rabbits, if they are hungry enough, they'll eat almost anything. <laughs> um, herbs generally require very little care, um, just your you know, basic um, meeting of the basic needs, water, light, um, balanced soil. And then with herbs, a little goes a long ways. So you don't need to grow a huge crop of herbs in order to enjoy them in your kitchen. So as we talk a little bit about growing herbs and some of their basic requirements, um, light, water, and fertilizer are the keys. And on fertilizer, um, generally, depending on our soil type, we probably won't need a lot of fertilizer. A, a light fertilizer with... Um, your basic miracle grow will probably um, be good enough. Um, but the one thing that we do want to keep in mind when growing herbs is that they do require at least six hours of daylight. So you definitely don't want to grow them in complete shade. Um, and then drainage is really important. Um, a lot of our herbs, like many of our other garden plants, don't like to have wet feet or wet roots. So make sure that our soil um, can drain well. Um, and then herbs aren't really picky as to where they grow. We can grow them in a container or we can grow them in a garden if we have space. 
And as I mentioned before, since a little goes a long way, the spot that we're growing them in doesn't have to be super big. Um, the one thing that is ideal is if we can locate um, the garden or the containers um, someplace close to the house and especially the kitchen because that's where we're most likely going to be using the parts of the herbs from. Um, another consideration, especially if we're growing the herbs in the ground, is that some herbs um, such, as, such as mint and borage are spreaders. Um, and then there's other ones that are heavy reseeders like dill and chamomile. Um, we do have some options um, as to whether or not we're going to direct seed or transplant our herbs. Um, some herbs are well suited um, for starting from seed and some are okay to use as transplants. Some don't like to have their roots messed with. So in some cases, it's better to start them um, directly from seed wherever we're going to be growing them. Um, as far as if we're going to try um, starting some herbs indoors, um, but before I talk about all of this, what I do want to encourage is that it's okay to experiment. Um, sometimes people will say certain things can't be done. Um, and I'm sometimes when it comes to growing plants, I'm one of those people who likes to try what can't be done and just to see if it'll work. So just because um, a certain herb might not be ideal for um, transplanting or starting from seed, it doesn't hurt to try. Um, so if you are going to try starting some herb seeds indoors, um, the one thing that I would recommend is check the seed package first um, because that's going to tell you um, the ideal time to start that, that seed. And that usually corresponds to a last frost date. And all of our areas that we're living in are probably going to be a little bit variable. And the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, the other thing that we want to keep in mind is the growth rate of the plant. And that's where the, the seed package label um, has some guidelines. They'll usually recommend anywhere from six to eight, maybe even 10 weeks, depending on how long it takes for a seed to germinate, um, to start them that many weeks before you intend to set them out in the garden. So that would be the next thing that you would consider is when, when are you planning to plant your garden? And um, we do want to keep in mind that most of our herbs are sensitive to frost. So we want to make sure that when we're planting them outside, that we're not going to, um, they're not going to be damaged by a, a late frost. Uh, thyme, rosemary, basil, sage, uh, chives, um, and tarragon can be a good um, candidate for starting indoors. Um, these usually have very fine seeds and have a longer germination period. Um, so depending on which zone, um, you might start them in early March um, to, to plant in mid to late May. And we'll talk about um, growing zones a little bit later in the next slide or two as well. Um, but first, before I do that, I would like to talk about um, a few herbs that do well by direct sowing in the in the garden or in a pot if that's how you're growing them and those would be um, cilantro dill and even basil basil works good both ways um, but if you do grow basil indoors you just want to make sure that um, it doesn't overgrow on you um, and we did have good luck um, with chives chives are a perennial and i'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit of myself, um, but I do a program with youth here in my county um, in the summer, and the last two years we've done a pizza garden theme, and we did grow some chives, and we direct sowed them into some raised beds, and um, sometimes raised beds are, are not the ideal um, scenario for planting a perennial. Um, however, these chives were apparently very hardy, and they did overwinter for us. So um, that's just another example of don't be afraid to try something that they say can't be done. 
Um, so talking about last frost dates, um, I just uh, updated this this chart uh, a couple days ago. Um, pulled the numbers off of the Old Farmers Almanac website, and it's just a guideline. Um, due to the unpredictability of North Dakota weather, um, you most gardeners usually tend to wait until Memorial Day um, it, or shortly thereafter to plant their gardens just because that's we can still typically get frost even up to Memorial Day. And so you can see from the various locations um, when the estimated last frost date is. And I'll just point out because I'm here in Rugby, North Dakota, um, our last frost date for this year happens to be May 30th. So I wouldn't um, be too excited to plant my garden or my herbs um, before that date. And even if you would get your herbs um, set out in the garden uh, a little bit later after that, you'll still have uh, plenty of, of um, herbaceous or leaf growth uh, to go through the, the uh, summer season. Um, for growing media, you would want to use a um, seed starter mix, something that contains um, peat moss, um, compost or perlite, and that's just to help provide some drainage. I'm going to stop just a second. Julie, are you still able to see the, the screen? Yes. Okay. So the peat moss, compost, and perlite is just to provide drainage. Um, potting soil is acceptable. However, I would maybe stay away from the um, potting soil mixes that have a fertilizer mixed in um, because that might be a little bit too much for the tender seedlings as they first start emerging. Um, and then another reminder is um, avoid using topsoil or garden soil, especially garden soil um, from outside because it can harbor diseases and bacteria that can affect the seedling growth. And then also it's more prone to crusting which can interfere with germination. Temperature is also very important when we're starting seeds. Um, most seedlings or seeds and seedlings like warm soil temperatures um, in that probably 70 to 80 degree range and that helps to promote germination. Um, some people and myself included, when I start seeds, I do like to have a seedling heat mat. Um, I've not tried it, but I suppose a heating pad would probably work, but you probably wouldn't want to use it um, for anything else. Um, and then the other thing as far as temperature is try to avoid window sills. And I know a lot of people like to put their seedlings um, in a window sill because of the lighting and that's good. However, this time of year, what we have to keep in mind is that the outdoor temperature drops drastically in the evenings. And so that can provide a draft, which our little seedlings don't appreciate as much. Um, and then after they've germinated, room temperatures are typically sufficient. The rule of thumb is if we're comfortable, they're comfortable. And then moisture is important. Um, we do want to keep the soil moist, but not overly wet. Um, the rule of thumb is that it should feel like a wrung out sponge. So it should be damp, but not soaking wet. And then of course, drainage is critical. We want to make sure that whatever we have the seedlings started in, that they can drain when we water them. And then if at all possible, it's best to use water that's room temperature so that we're not shocking uh, our, our seedlings. Um, another thing that I like to do when I do my seed starting is I like to pre-moisten my seed starting mix until it feels like that wrung out sponge. Um, it just makes putting it in your um, seed starting containers a whole lot easier. And then if you've ever watered dry potting soil, you know that it has a tendency to um, 
kind of overflow almost like a potting soil volcano until it until the water can absorb into it and so it can make a mess and it can dislodge your seedlings so that's why I like to pre moisten uh, my seed starting mix before I plant um, one other tip is um, in order to keep the moisture in and keep it even um, I like to cover my seed starting flats or containers with clear plastic saran wrap works um, if you have a clear plastic bread bag and a small container you can put that over the top of them too um, that helps to hold in the moisture and then it'll also help hold in some heat um, the one thing that can happen um, depending on how warm your environment is um, we all know that mold likes warm and damp so mold could become a problem and if that's the case um, poke some holes in the bag or the plastic covering or even remove it for an hour or so at a time um, to help increase air circulation and then once the seeds germinate um, typically in 10 to 14 days make sure to remove that plastic you might not um, all of your seeds may not germinate but when the majority of them are poking through the soil that's your cue to get that plastic off um, lighting is also important when we're starting seeds um, the quality of the light isn't as important as the quantity um, and this is more so after the seeds have germinated um, because most seeds don't need light to germinate they just need warmth moisture and darkness but after germination, when that seedling first appears above the soil, that's when light becomes a necessity. And keep in mind that it's the quantity, not the quality, that's key. Um, generally, seedlings need anywhere from 16 to 18 hours of daylight to be their healthiest. Um, and that's where grow lights do come in very handy. Um, there's nothing wrong with starting seeds in a windowsill if that's all that you have. Um, just be aware that you could have more leaning and um, spindlier plants because they're not getting as much light as they need. Um, and speaking of light, um, I generally like to put my um, grow lights on a timer um, because then I can be assured that they're getting the full 18 or 16 hours of light um, that they need. And when I put a grow light on my, my um, seedlings, I usually use my hand as a guide and you want to keep that light as close to the seedlings as possible um, I usually put my hand over the top of the seedlings in the tray and then I put the light just above my hand if my hand feels warm from the light I adjust the light up a little bit higher if it's too warm for my hand it's going to be too warm for the seedlings and the reason that you put the light so close to them is because plants have a tendency to grow towards light. If the light is too high, they're going to grow towards that light and you'll have spindlier, leggier plants. Um, make sure to label your containers uh, because when they're small, they're going to be hard to tell um, or differentiate between what seed is planted where. Um, you'll want to plant at least five seeds or if the seeds are very small, a pinch in each cell and then lightly cover them. Uh, the rule of thumb is to plant the seed just two times deeper than um, its thickness under the soil. Some of these seeds, if they're really tiny, you may not even need to cover them. And then when they get big enough, you'll thin them to one plant per pot. And in six to eight weeks, you'll pinch the tops off and that encourages lat lateral growth and a bushier plant and then harden them before you set them out. And then I just put together a, just a short, not very complete list of some um, herbs for North Dakota outdoors. And I won't go through all of this. Um, this is where I cue myself to talk about the plant hardiness zones. Most herbs in North Dakota are annuals, with the exception of maybe some zone fours. Um, and you might need to heavily mulch those. Um, some perennials are just not hardy for our zone, but they might be able to be brought inside and overwintered as house plants. Um, so the, the rule of thumb is if a plant is hardy one or two zones 
um, above whatever zone you're in. Um, it might be worth trying to overwinter outside as long as you have a good snow cover and it's been given plenty of mulch. And so here's just a quick overview of the plant hardiness zones um, for the United States. I'm up in Rugby, North Dakota. Um, so that's the top half of North Dakota in that um, pinkish purple area, which is zone three. Um, there's some zone three A and some zone three B, um, but for the most part, um, it's gonna get about minus 40 um, at any given time here. So I wanna make sure that I'm choosing zone three perennials um, if that's what I'm looking to grow. And then the light purple area or lavender is zone four and that's about minus 30 to minus 25. And I would say that's probably, I know Highway 52 doesn't go straight across North Dakota, but generally I would use that as my guide. Probably south of Highway 52 is gonna be more of our zone four um, plants. Um, some good herbs for beginners would be common or sweet basil, dill, uh, parsley. Um, perennial herbs that would be good for beginners um, would be chives, peppermint, spearmint, um, parsley. Parsley is a biennial. That means it takes two years to complete its life cycle or to produce seed. Um, zone fours, I probably would not recommend um, for beginners. That would be more your seasoned gardeners. Um, and French tarragon um, will mostly likely be propagated from plants because it rarely produces viable seed. And anise um, doesn't transplant very well, but you can always try the impossible. And then keep in mind that some herbs will self-seed. And then I did want to um, quickly touch on the fact that herbs um, can be um, irresistible to our foraging pollinator insects. And um, there's a number of herbs that attract butterflies and a number of herbs that also attract bees. Um, and pollinators, um, such as bees, actually service about $15 billion in crops um, in the US. And they're really the lifeblood of vegetable and fruit production here. Um, they're responsible for the pollination of 75% um, of our fruits, nuts, and vegetables. So that includes our almonds, berries, citrus fruits, and cucurbits, which would be your cucumbers, your melons, those types of plants. Um, so definitely consider sprinkling um, some herbs in your flower beds or even growing them in your vegetable garden among um, your vegetable plants to help attract those pollinators. You might even increase um, some of your garden yields um, with these pollinator attracting herbs. Um, a, an example would be tomatoes. Uh, tomatoes can be self-pollinated, but you'll get more fruit um, if they're pollinated by bumblebees. So something to keep in mind. Um, for harvesting herbs, we'll want to start when the plant has enough foliage to maintain its growth. That's usually anywhere from six to eight inches tall. And we can harvest up to 75% of the current season's growth at one time. Um, perennial herbs, we might remove only about a third. And then we do want to harvest early in the morning um, after the dew dries, but before the heat of the day. And this is because we'll capture the optimal aroma and flavor. And it also cuts down on potential of disease spread. And then herbs are best harvested before they start to flower. Otherwise, um, leaf production declines once flowering starts. So if your herbs are starting to flower, if you deadhead them, pinch the, pinch the flowers off, that will prolong your leaf production. And um, you can harvest annual herbs all the way up until frost. If you have perennial herbs like chives, um, you can harvest until late August. After that, we want to stop because we want that plant to start getting ready for winter. And then even though tarragon and lavender are a little bit trickier um, to grow up here, lavender is a zone five plant, but you might grow it as an annual. Um, it can be sheared to half their height in early summer um, to encourage a second fall flowering. 
And I'll know more about growing lavender in zone three after this summer, um, because for our youth garden project, we will be, we have a history themed garden. So we'll be growing some lavender um, to try and make some dyes and then also to use in um, sachets uh, and potpourri. Uh, so I'll know more about lavender in our, our colder zones. Um, using herbs, we want to um, rinse the fresh herbs under running water and then pat dry. And we want to cut them into tiny pieces. And the reason that we cut them into small pieces is to expose more surface area to give more optimal flavor. Uh, guidelines for how much to use. A uh, general rule of thumb is two teaspoons of fresh herbs are equivalent to three quarters of a teaspoon of dried herbs or one quarter teaspoon of powdered herbs. And then keep in mind we have different flavors of herbs. Um, our strongly flavored herbs would include bay leaves, rosemary, and sage. Moderately flavored um, herbs would be our basil, dill, mints, marjoram, and oregano. Um, mild flavored herbs are chives and parsley, and so we can use a lot of these and not affect our dish. Um, so one thing to remember is don't overdo it with herbs. Try to use them for variety and accent only, and usually try to use only one strongly flavored herb alone um, or pair it with two more mild flavored herbs. Um, if you're new to using herbs in cooking, um, a way to acquaint yourself with the unique flavors of herbs that you might be growing would be to chop or crush a few of um, the fresh herb leaves very finely and then add it to a tablespoon of softened butter or cream cheese. And then just let that set for about an hour and spread it on a cracker or a piece of bread so that you can um, discover the unique taste and see if that's a flavor that you like or not. Um, for storing herbs, we can store them uh, for up to a week in the refrigerator. Um, just keep in mind that the flavor and the aroma of herbs deteriorates quite quickly after um, picking. So we do want to be prepared to use them as soon as we can. And so if we're storing them, we want to trim the ends of the stems and then um, we'll store them in a glass or a vase with about an inch of water in the bottom. And then we'll cover it loosely with a plastic bag um, so that we can allow for some air circulation so we're not getting mold. Um, and then we change the water daily. And then of course wash under cool water and pat dry. Um, you may want to try preserving some herbs and there's a couple, a few different ways to do that. Um, we can air dry them, dehydrate them, um, dry them in a microwave, and we can freeze them. So I'll just briefly talk about each one. So for air drying, of course, we'll pick the plants at their peak just before they bloom. Um, we'll bunch the washed herbs and then we'll tie the stems with a string and we'll hang them upside down for about two weeks, um, being sure that they're completely dry before we store them. And one way to test if they're dry um, is to crumble the leaves. And if they crumble easily, they're dry. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that sometimes our stems have an undesirable flavor. So we may want to keep those out. So just using the leaves. We can dry either using an oven or a dehydrator. Um, so we'll wash the herbs and we'll set the oven to 100 degrees Fahrenheit or its lowest setting. And then we'll heat until the leaves are brittle. Um, testing hourly. And then since dehydrators are all different, um, you'll want to follow the manufacturer's instructions. Microwave drying is a possibility. Um, so you'll, after the herbs are washed, you'll place two bunches between paper towels and then you'll microwave on high for one to three minutes, making sure that you check every 30 seconds. And then once they're cool, you'll test to see if the herbs are brittle. So if they crumble well, um, they're dry. Freezing herbs, um, you'll want to use some airtight bags or containers to freeze them in. 
Um, you'll place chopped herbs in ice cube trays and you can cover them with water and freeze. And then when you're ready to use them, you or when you're ready to store them, you just pop the cubes out and you put them in freezer bags. And when you want to use them in whatever dish it is that you're making, you can just drop the whole cube into your soup or your stew. Storing your herbs and spices, um, you want to make sure that you're keeping them away from moisture. Uh, tightly covered jars or containers, uh, store in a cool place and keep them out of um, sunlight and try not to store them near heat sources. Um, for best flavor, it's recommended to use your herbs within one year. And then just quickly, I wanted to go through uh, a few um, of the different herbs and give you an idea what they look like. Um, so anise uh, is technically a zone for perennial. So depending on which zone you live in or are gardening in, um, this may or may not overwinter for you. Um, if you're in zone three, um, like I am, um, I wouldn't be afraid to try to overwinter it with some extra mulch. I would probably give it at least um, 12 to 18 inches of mulch, um, straw, leaves, um, that kind of thing, and then hope for a good snow cover, which it sounds like down south, um, uh, the southern part of the state, we got good snow cover. Um, so it is a short-lived perennial. Um, it's about three to five feet tall, and it is in the mint family. Um, it does like a uh, sunny location, and it is not pH sensitive. Um, it does like adequate water. If we don't have enough, um, it can cause some wilting. And the parts that you'll eat will be the leaves or the flowers, and they tend to have a licorice scent. Um, and the flowers are very attractive to pollinators. So it can be a nice addition to a curbside flower bed or just a any flower bed that you have in the yard. One of my favorite herbs is basil. Um, I like it because it's a milder herb um, and it pairs well with a lot of dishes, um, but it's most commonly used in tomato sauces, um, pastas and pesto or Italian dishes. Uh, it is an annual herb and it is very cold sensitive. Um, so we wanna make sure that when we're setting that one out, the danger of frost is past. Um, it likes full sun, well-drained soil. Um, and then you do want to keep an eye on this one and um, deadhead to discourage flowering because we're going to be using the leaves on, on this one. And the leaves are very delicate, so we do want to handle them very carefully to prevent damage to the leaves. And as you'll find out, there are a lot of varieties of basil. Um, the Genovese is the preferred culinary type. But there are some um, citrus flavored basils, um, so you can add some unique flavors and scents to your cooking. Uh, chamomile um, is attractive to some gardeners um, because it's often used in teas. Uh, it's very easy to grow. Um, it's easy enough to grow that it has the potential to become a weed because it reseeds very easily. Um, it is low growing and it does adapt well to many soil types. Uh, chives is another of my favorite herbs because of its mild um, flavor. Can be used in soups, chowders, salad dressings, potatoes, meat, poultry, fish, eggs, and cheese. Very, very versatile herb. Um, it's very easy to grow and it does tend to form clumps and it is a perennial um, and so, and it will reseed itself after it flowers. Um, that's where the seeds will be. And so you should deadhead um, to encourage new growth as well. Um, full sun is its only requirement. It is also very adaptable to many soil types, even grows well in containers. And as I mentioned earlier, we had it regrow in a raised bed. So um, very cold tolerant from my experience. Uh, cilantro or coriander, usually used in ethnic cuisines like Mexican. Um, it can be used in Chinese, South American dishes, Vietnamese dishes. If we're using the foliage, um, we call it cilantro. 
if we're using the seeds, we call it coriander. Um, pretty easy to please, full sun, regular water. Um, in the Middle Ages, it's rumored that it was used as an aphrodisiac. Dill is another uh, very popular herb. Um, this one is also um, uh, a very easy reseeder, um, and it does thrive in cool weather. Um, if you are looking to use the foliage of dill, um, a couple of varieties to try are bouquet or ducat. Um, dill is popular in pickles, sauces, salads, fish, and chicken dishes. Um, garlic isn't technically an herb, it's a vegetable, but a lot of people like to um, grow garlic, and I do get a lot of questions in my office about garlic. Um, it's used to flavor salsa, stir fry, spaghetti sauce, um, almost anything you can think of. Uh, it's very, well, it's not a very hardy perennial, but it is a hardy perennial in the onion family. Um, we do have a variety that is hardy for North Dakota, um, and that is a hard neck variety. Um, so if you're looking to try garlic, German red or Spanish roja would be the varieties that you would want to try. Now, when they talk about garlic, um, we talk about hard neck or soft neck. And hard neck are typically harder, hardier for North Dakota, so zones three through five. Um, they will produce um, larger cloves, but fewer. And the soft neck varieties will produce more, but smaller cloves. And typically what we find in the grocery stores is the soft neck variety. And the reason for that is they have a longer shelf life, typically six to eight months. But again, remember, the soft neck varieties are not hardy for North Dakota. Um, and if we are going to plant garlic in North Dakota, um, it's best planted in late September to early October. So garlic is planted in the fall, and then we harvest it in the following growing season. Um, as I mentioned earlier, lavender is a zone five plant. Um, it's native to the hot, dry Mediterranean climates. And the oils are most concentrated in the flowers. And culinary uses include teas and beverages and savory dishes with meats and vegetables. And with lavender, a little goes a long way. Um, but again, um, I like to test the limits. So um, if you have a, a, a nice microclimate and you're able to mulch it well, uh, you might be able to get lavender to overwinter in zone four, maybe even up here in three. We'll see after this, this growing season. Um, but in zones three and four, it's best treated like an annual. Uh, lemon balm is a perennial in the mint family, um, hardy to zones four through nine. Um, so depending on which zone you're in, if you're up here in three like me, um, it might need a heavy mulch, and don't be surprised if it doesn't overwinter. Um, it can be used in teas, soups and sauces, vinaigrettes, um, marinades, seafoods, all kinds of different things. Um, it does lose a lot of its flavor when it's dried, so it's best used when it's fresh. Um, even though it loses a lot of its flavor when it's dried, um, it still keeps enough fragrance um, to make it a nice addition to potpourri. And then the leaf flavor does turn bitter when the flower buds appear. So you want to keep on top of deadheading if you're planning to use uh, the leaves of lemon balm. Oregano, um, depending on, again, what zone you live in, um, some varieties are perennial to zone four. Um, the herb itself is pungent, um, kind of spicy and slightly bitter. At least I think it's kind of bitter. Um, so if I have a recipe that calls for oregano, I use just a little bit. You can always add more. Um, but oregano is definitely one of those stronger flavored herbs that a little goes a long ways. Um, commonly used in Italian, Greek, and Spanish dishes, and it pairs well with meats and tomato dishes. Um, it likes a well-drained sandy soil. Um, definitely does not like to be overwatered. Um, 
also doesn't do super well um, seed starting. Um, we started some last year um, for our pizza garden um, and it did grow, but it wasn't as happy as it was the the stuff that we actually planted in the ground we did we did a comparison for the kids so that we could see which did better and it actually did better um, starting it directly in the garden um, marjoram is a is a cousin or in the same family as oregano so it has an oregano like flavor but it's a little more um, subtle um, and it's described as having a floral and woodsy flavor. Um, and because it's a little bit lighter and more subtle, you would add it more towards the end of cooking. And you could use it in place of oregano for a gentler flavor. Mints, um, their hardiness um, de depends on the variety. Um, so it could be anywhere from a zone three to a zone five. So make sure you check the seed package or if you're um, finding mint plants make sure you check the zone on the tag um, if they are a perennial four-year zone they can be fast growing spreaders so you might want to make sure to keep them in check um, spading some out that kind of thing uh, they do like rich moist soil and they prefer partial shade and then we can use the leaves in beverages salads they're also popular with lamb uh, fish and poultry dishes. Parsley is a popular herb. Um, it's a biennial. That means it takes two growing seasons to complete its life cycle and produce seed. It's a member of the carrot family, so you will smell um, a, a carrot aroma when you pick the, the leaves or the stems. Um, it is an important food source for the black swallowtail larvae. Um, black swallowtail is a, a butterfly uh, here in North Dakota. And so you shouldn't be alarmed if you see some um, large striped uh, caterpillar-like worms eating your uh, parsley. Um, that is the, their favorite food source. Um, flat leaf. Uh, varieties are better for flavor, whereas the curly leaf varieties um, are used more when you want a fancy garnish. And they're commonly used in sauces, salads, and soups. Um, French tarragon it can be hardy to zone four with protection. It is in the sunflower family, so if you've ever um, tasted a sunflower leaf, or part of a sunflower plant, you know that the flavor can be kind of sweet, but yet a little bitter. Um, so the flavor is described as a combination of vanilla and licorice with a slightly peppery taste. And the bitter taste might be more pronounced in the Russian variety. And so it's used mostly for vinegars, pickles, and sour dishes. Uh, rosemary can be a perennial in zones five and up, um, but in our area it would be grown more as an annual. Um, and they are an evergreen type plant um, with needle-like foliage. They have a spicy aromatic flavor. Um, I classify the flavor as kind of a piney flavor, um, so it's kind of pungent and can be overpowering. Uh, it is popular in Mediterranean dishes. Uh, so a little goes a long way on the rosemary. Thyme um, is, uh, has an earthy flavor with a lemon and mint tone to it. Um, it's often included in seasoning blends for poultry and stuffing. Um, also commonly used in fish sauces. Uh, it goes well with lamb and veal. Um, Hardiness will depend on the variety, so you'll want to make sure that you read the seed package or the seed tag if you're finding plants. Um, it, 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 it can make a, a good ground cover because it is low growing, um, and then, or if it, depending on variety, if you have the creeping variety, it'll be low growing um, and therefore can make a nice ground cover. Uh, fennel is uh, kind of another fun um, herb. It's actually a vegetable. 
Um, and it is a perennial related to parsley. Um, in zone three, um, we would treat it like an annual and it does enjoy cool weather. Uh, the foliage does resemble dill and it's an anise flavored uh, veggie. So it will have kind of a, a licorice like flavor. And you can use either the seeds, the leaves or the bulbs. And you would use it a lot like you would use celery. Um, so it can be commonly used in French and Italian cuisines. So that's a quick rundown on just a few different herbs. Um, so uh, in the end, you know, just have fun with your herbs. Um, don't be afraid to try new ones. Um, be a little adventurous, experiment to find out which ones you like. Um, and then also try preparing a pizza or a pasta dish with dried oregano versus fresh or dry, dried oregano and basil versus fresh oregano and basil and see which you prefer. Um, the tastes are, there's, there's a, a definitely a difference. So for sure, what I'd like to leave you with is just have fun, experiment, and, and be adventurous. And then as Julie mentioned, um, there should be links to two handouts um, uh, from garden to table, harvesting um, herbs for healthy eating, and then also um, from garden to table, garlic. And with that, I would like to open it up to any questions. Okay, I answered one of the questions, I think. Um, somebody asked about storing herbs in water. And actually, the idea is to trim the end of the stem off and put the stems in water and not the entire herb. Otherwise, yes. any, anytime you put anything in water, it's going to break down faster. Yes. So other questions, you can go ahead and type into the chat box. Have you ever preserved herbs in salt? Hmm. I'm not aware of that, Julie. I'll let you handle that. <laughs> I, I have not. I have not. Have you? I have not. <laughs> um, and we have a lot of different methods on the handouts that you referred to. And... Drying is really an easy method, but you can also chop them up and put them into ice cube trays with water, and then you can simply pop out a cube and drop it into your recipe. So that's another method. But haven't seen anything about putting them in salt. Okay, oh. what, what percent of the herb leaves on the plant should be picked at any given time? You could pick up to three quarters of the the green the green material on the plant, or a third. General rule of thumb would be a third to three quarters of the plant. Uh, where do we find the handouts that you are referring to? If you simply Google NDSU Extension Field to Fork, you will find it. And I can also pop that into the chat box. I'll have to look for it right now, unless Bob gets ahead of me. And I'm not sure the field to fork might be up on the screen right now. I, I can only see it on my side. I don't know if you or Bob can see it. There, I just popped it in the okay. chat box. So you're going to find all kinds of materials on that website. There's even a, some printable pages of a calendar. There's a beginning guide to harvest, um, weed identification guide. If you decide to be a food entrepreneur and sell all these herbs that you're going to grow, there's a site on there. And also our food preservation resources, plus all the webinars. So it's a very large site with lots of things to explore. Any other questions? So I see someone commented, Lucinda said, lavender plant came back the last eight years in South Fargo. Who would have thought? <laughs> oh, good for you, Lucinda. That's awesome. <laughs> That's great. Any other questions? 
Well, we hope that uh, if there aren't any other questions, we hope that you join us next week for our final webinar of the year, I guess, or at least right now. And certainly give us feedback on other topics that you want, because I certainly hope that we can continue doing these field to fork. Because this spring we've had, well, according to my records, about 515 people participate. Wow, that's awesome. So thanks to all of you, and please check out the website and let us know if you have any questions.